I want you to open your Bibles. Let's go uh, this morning to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Last week was powerful. Neil brought a great word last week. Can you say amen? Powerful, powerful word. Sunday before that, we talked a little bit about the church, the ecclesia, who we are, what we do, how we function. I want to talk this morning a little bit about why we do. Everybody say, why we do. You know it's important to know why we do what we do, right? So many people do things out of habit. Some people do things out of fear. Some people do things just because they're told to do it. But we need to do things on purpose. When I use the word purpose there, it, the word purpose I'm using in the context of your purpose. We do things in our life according to the purpose, our own purpose for what God has called each of us to do. I want to just start with a question this morning, two of them actually. And the first one is, why go to church? Why go to church? I'll follow that up with, that's actually the wrong question. We shouldn't be asking, why do we go to church? We should be asking, why do we congregate? Why do we assemble? We saw last week that we don't go to church, we are the church. Amen? So keep that in mind that we're not, we, today you did not come to church. You brought church with you when you walked in the building. Hallelujah. And in this process, if this is the case, and we look at this, we need to learn why do we congregate? Why does the church congregate? Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to verse 25. It says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. Say draw near. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean, even from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast. Say hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. i got to say that one more time. That excites me. He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, and not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. Oh no. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let's pray. Father, this morning we're thankful for your word. And Father, we ask that you would give us ears to begin to hear what Holy Spirit is saying to your church. Speak to us this morning from heaven, Father. Let us hear clearly, receive deeply, and walk out strongly and mightily the word that you're bringing into this house today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. In verse 25, he tells us that we should not forsake ourselves the assembling together. Everybody say assemble. Now I don't know about you, but in, in Hawaii it happens this way. People say, well I don't have to go to church. I don't have to be with the church. I don't need to fellowship. I don't need to uh, assemble somewhere. Actually the scripture tells us it's very important for us that we come together as believers. Amen? Some key words here that that give us actually our assignment when we come together. The thing here is knowing that we are to assemble, to gather, to come together is changes everything that we could think about church. Why? Because he said when you come together, let one have a psalm, let one have a hymn, let one have a tongue, right? When we come together, we are bringing different gifts different pieces of the body of Christ into one room to be able to accomplish what's on the Father's heart 
for that moment. See, we're incomplete without you. We cannot fulfill what God has called us to do in this community, in this state, even in this nation, without you being in your part. The Word tells us in Habakkuk, He says this, He said, I will write the vision, I'm going to make it plain. He says, I'm going to stand upon the tower. I'm going to find my place on the tower. And then He says, I'm going to watch to see what the Lord would say. Now, I don't know if, you, if you've ever watched words. I can hear what people say, but so many times it's difficult to watch what someone says. Why did he say, I'm going to watch what God says? Because God's words are creative. Oh, hallelujah. And when God speaks, it's not just going into the ear, it's going into the atmosphere. And God's words, when He speaks it, it shifts things. It changes things. It's supernatural over your life, over this community, over this state, and over this nation. The Word of God does not return to Him void. Amen? It actually accomplishes what it was designed to do. And the body coming together is so important for releasing what God has for this region. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Jesus is saying here, you've seen me do some pretty amazing things. When you read the Gospels, would you agree with me that Jesus has done some amazing things? I don't know when the last time you walked on water was, but I read that Jesus did, and it was pretty amazing. We were on the Sea of Galilee one time on a boat, and I gave the opportunity. Anybody that wants to practice walking on water, now's your chance. It's the actual same sea that Jesus was on. There were no takers. <laughs> but Jesus said this. He said, I've done great works, and you've seen them. He healed the blind eyes. He caused the deaf to begin to hear, the lame to walk. Jesus raised the dead. He healed the leper. He did all of those things, but He said this. To those that believe in me, he said, you will do greater works. So I just decree over this house today and everyone in my hearing that you're shifting into greater works in Jesus' name. You are moving into greater works in the name of Jesus. You, may, you will never see a sick person healed unless you lay your hands on them and speak over their life. So start putting your hands on the sick and be bold in Jesus' name. Amen? Let God use you to prophesy and give a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Let God use you to cast out devils. Most of the church runs from devils. Or they put them on the board. Hallelujah. <laughs> Not here. Hallelujah. Right? <laughs> we are to be people that have dominion over things that are supernatural. God's going to begin to cause, when we step into this place, God's going to begin to cause things that were not to begin to be. We have been given a grace. Grace is an empowerment to reign. We've been given a grace, a window of heaven to begin to step through and be the supernatural people that God has called us to be. Amen? You're important. You're not only important, you're valuable. God is not done with you. God is not finished with you. He's recharging you. He's not retiring you. He's refiring you. Hallelujah. He's tempering you for the next level of ministry that He's given you. You may say, well, Apostle Greg, I've only been taught to come to church and get the pastors to pray for me and all that. No, no, no. You're the body. You're the body. You're the hands of God. You're the body of God. The valuable, the necessary breath of God lives in you to accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished. Ephesians chapter 4, write this down. I don't have it on the slides, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through verse 16. Go home and read that today. It says that the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, they are given to the church. They are gifts of Jesus to the church. 1 Corinthians 12, you have the gifts of the Spirit. In Ephesians 4, you have the gifts of Jesus. They are given to the church to equip you, the saints, 
to do the work of ministry. It's not actually our job or responsibility to do the work of ministry. It's yours. Look at somebody say, that's your responsibility. Now tell the person that told you that the same thing, amen, so they don't get off the hook. Yeah. We are to equip you to do the stuff. What stuff? The stuff that Jesus did, the greater works, the things that needed done in your family, in your body, in your marriage, in your home, in your community, at your job, wherever it may be, you carry an anointing in your life every moment, every second, every day to release the goodness of God. The anointing is not the little chill bumps you get up and down your back when the presence of God is heavy. That's not the anointing. The anointing is tangible within you. It's not even a feeling. It's not even I've got to feel spiritual. It's part of your DNA. It's part of who you are. And you see a sick person, you don't have to say, I don't feel spiritual today. I don't want to pray for them. They may not get healed. No, just because. Everybody say just because. Just because you are a son of and a daughter of God, you can lay your hands on the sick and they will recover. It's not out of feeling. It's not out of a religious act of any kind. It's out of a legal document that God created in His Word that says sons will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There's no Greek meaning to that that says if you feel like it, if you woke up on the right side of the bed or you had, you know, your two or three cups of coffee this morning. No, it's not any of that. It's simply a legal act that God gave us. Not legalism, but a legal heavenly kingdom act that is active in you every moment, every day, because God decreed it into your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The law of God... And when I say the law of God, I mean the decrees of God that have been set forth in your life to work, they work whether you feel like God's with you or not. Amen. Let me give you a good Aussie example. See, when you're driving down these roads and you see those speed limit signs, there may not be a policeman around. But if you speed, you'll have a ticket arrive at your house complimentary of the government. Am I right? Huh. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> I'm trying to learn this mileage and all those metric stuff. Yeah, there's no grace for that. But I found out that there is law that is in place and will be executed even if there is no lawman around. Selah. Right? It's the same principle in your life. You may not feel like God's around. You may not feel spiritual. But it does not mean that what God has said with His Word and the words of the King is law. He said, you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Isn't that amazing? God is shifting. He's opening up revelation and understanding to the church today that you carry as much anointing as we do. You carry authority like we do. And we are waking you up and shaking you and we're declaring over you that God is activating you and using you every moment, every day of your life to begin to see people come into God's goodness. Greater works will you do because I go to the Father. Jesus said, my absence from you will produce greater in you. What? We always say, come Lord, come Lord, Lord Jesus, come. Would you heal Jesus? Would you touch this one, Jesus? And Jesus is actually saying, my absence produces greater in you. Think about that. Why? Because Holy Spirit is in you. Jesus is saying, I'm at the right hand of the Father, I'm in my rightful position, and I've shifted you into your rightful position by depositing Holy Spirit in you as a down payment of more to come. So we can step out, whether we feel like it or not. What, I haven't been trained to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't need to know how to do these things. 
The scripture in Mark 16 didn't even actually tell you to pray. It just says, touch them. Lay your hands on them. Doesn't that take some pressure off? If you feel like praying, pray, but pray the right prayers. Pray scripture. Quote scripture over them if you want to do that. But it doesn't even instruct you to pray. It just says, lay your hands because what's in you will be transferred to them. Remember a few weeks ago, part of the word of the Lord was that this place was going to be a pool of God's glory and supernatural and God was going to build conduit out into the cities and out into the communities and you are that conduit. This is what Mark 16 is talking about. You are that conduit of God to bring about the supernatural of God in your life. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. We need one another. God is pouring out His Spirit in Australia in a brand new way. It's not going to come out of the pulpit this time is coming out of the chair, the seat, is coming out of your life. It's not just going to happen in a building somewhere, even though we will see it as we congregate. It's going to begin to happen in your office building, in your shop, in your work building, at the market, at the hardware store, out on the street, out on the beach, because that's where you are. First Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I'm just going to start with verse 9, but you can read the rest when you get home. But you are a... Now this is God saying what you are. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I don't know about you, but that stirs me up. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. God, you had, you, you, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He says here something very, very important. He said, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation for God's own possession. And then after that, it gives you an assignment. You're not these things just so you can feel good. You're not these things so you can just say, I'm going to heaven. You're not these things so you can just say, my name is on the roll. No, you can't. It's not for that. It says in this passage of Scripture that God called you and God made you these things so that you might proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness <clears throat> into His marvelous light. I am a chosen generation, a chosen people. I am a royal priesthood. And my assignment is to stand out in the midst of those that are in darkness and proclaim His excellencies. Psalms 139, it says, Oh, your works, they are wonderful, and my soul knows it well. You may say, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to give a testimony. Well, then just stand in the midst of people and begin to tell them of the goodness of God. What God has done in your life, it'll build hope. It'll bring strength and encouragement when you begin to declare His excellencies. That's a hard word for a redneck tongue. <laughs> See, he's, a, he's royalty. He's a king. It didn't say go and just tell people about your church. It said tell them about the king and his excellencies. Whoo, hallelujah. It says he brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are God's people. We come together for purpose, and we come together on purpose 
to release God's heart out into this community. We do not just congregate or assemble to get things, but we also, we, we also come to bring impartation to others. When the scripture says that we come together, it's not just to get. It's not just to receive. It's not just, all right, preacher, see if you can bless me today. I had a really hard week. Oh, no, that's not it. It's you are carrying within you the anointing that destroys yokes. And somebody you're sitting beside today may need a breakthrough. And God's got it in you to bring it. Hallelujah. Somebody that you may meet at the door and shake their hand. Holy Spirit may drop in you. They need a word. They need a prayer. They need encouraging. Obey the Lord and let God use you to break bondages off of their life. You're important. You're anointed. You're called. You're chosen to bring the marvelous light of God into the dark places of people's lives. Hallelujah. Listen to this. The word congregate, it means to collect into a group or a crowd to assemble. To come together. The word out of Hebrews, the word assemble, listen to this. It means to bring together in a particular place. That's us, the church. We are assembled here today to bring a particular place for a particular purpose. We are assembled. Forsake not yourselves the assembling together. Don't forsake coming together in one place for one purpose. When you are not here, the church, the body, hurts. Do you believe that today? Three of you do. My prayer is the rest of you will before you leave. <laughs> Praise God. You are so valuable. Can you imagine? The scripture says one will put a thousand to fly, but two will put ten thousand to fly. What if we had two hundred? Woo! And we're not far from it. Hallelujah. I'm going to just make a declaration. My prayer is before the end of this month, we'll have 200 seats in here that'll be filled in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You may say, Greg, how are you and Neil going to do it? We're not going to do it. You're going to do it. Hallelujah. You're going to bring your friends, bring your family, bring your enemies. Hallelujah. Get the worst person you know that hates you the most to say there's a reconciliation taking place on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. I want you to come with me because I want us to be friends again. And you're going to sit on one side, maybe they'll sit on the other side, but you'll meet in the middle before it's over. Hallelujah. We've got to do that. We've got to bring people. We say, why don't we bring people to church? We're not bringing people to church. We're bringing people to assemble. We're bringing people together. Why? Because when they meet Jesus, that's a piece of the body that was lost but now found. That was inactive but now is being activated. Does that make sense? And when we reach out and we bring people, we invite people, we go pick up people, we bring them into the house of God, they begin to find their niche, they find their place, and their life begins to be lived on purpose. Hallelujah. In a particular place for a particular purpose. Listen to this. Assemble means to fit together the parts. To fit together the parts. Now, men, you will you will relate to this maybe a little more than the women do. But when you assemble something, like for example, on Christmas morning, you brought your kids a bike and it comes in a box and that box has lots of parts and you dump it out on the floor and you look at it and you back away and you look at it and you say, I am man. I will conquer. What's that piece of paper for? Right? And you throw the paper aside and you jump in and you get to work and bless God, you're so good that when it's done, you got parts left over. <laughs> right? That's an accomplishment, right? We didn't eat all they gave us. We made a bicycle. Whenever you, whenever you look at that scenario, that's exactly what the church is. There's an instruction book that we need to follow to get this thing assembled. You don't want your kid riding a bike down on the river somewhere and and, and his wheel run off and he go off in the river. You don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen to the church either. We must read instructions. <laughs> Amen. No extra parts. 
No extra nuts and bolts and springs left over. They all got to fit together. This is what's happening when we begin to reach out and bring people in. God is actually using you to get parts of the bike in the right place so that whenever we ride it, it won't fall apart. God is bringing His church together. And I want you to watch this. I pray your eyes are open and you can begin to see that what God is doing, how He's using you and bringing you to a place that you're reaching out and you're finding parts, pieces that have been missing to the puzzle and bringing them in to be assembled together for purpose. Now let me give you the rest of the definition of the word symbol. It means to convene as a body who legislates. What? You mean we don't just come to sing songs and to hear a sermon? No, we are here to legislate. A few weeks ago, we said that the word church was the word ecclesia, right? The word ecclesia, if you'll remember, it meant the elders that sat at the gate who determined what could come in and go out of the city. There's some things in our city and in our state and in our nation that doesn't need to be here. Come on now. I got two claps out of that. I'm telling you, abortion will not leave this nation until there is an ecclesia, until there is a church that is assembled together to speak to the corruption, the death and the murder, and drive it out to the sea. It will not leave Australia until the church takes its place and is assembled. The iniquity of homosexuality will not leave our families. Will not stop ruling and shaping our culture until there is an ecclesia that rises up and says we will be politically incorrect. We will be kingdom correct and we will speak to the bondage and the darkness that is binding those that God wants to be found. And we begin to speak to those things and we begin to say, no more in the name of Jesus. You have invaded and taken over our culture and we evict you in Jesus' name. Yeah. See, God doesn't hate the homosexual. He hates the iniquity that is destroying their life and keeping them from their purpose. Right? So let's be kingdom correct. Let's forget this political correctness. Let's be kingdom correct and stand up and begin to see our community, our state, and our nation set free. When we come together, we sing our songs and we worship Him, yes. But there are times that Holy Spirit begins to move and we will shift into that legislative mode and we'll begin to hear and see things that we need to address as a church. And we can begin to pray into them and speak into them and begin to decree into them the will and the heart of the Father. And you'll turn your TV on later and you'll begin to see those things that begin to shift in the natural. Why? Because and ecclesia has come together to legislate to do the will and the heart of the Father see I don't believe in all this gloom and doom mess this says you know oh it's got to get worse it's got to get worse it's got to get worse I actually know of ministries in the states that are praying it gets worse and they, they use the scripture, oh, don't you know in, the, in, the, in Isaiah it says there's going to be a, a great darkness, a deep darkness that's going to cover the earth. I said, yes, I do, but read on. There's going to be a light. Yeah. Hallelujah. A great light that's going to come forth and shine out of the darkness. Hallelujah. God is shaping his church. He's assembling his church. He's bringing his church together. And it doesn't matter how young or old you are. It doesn't matter how gifted you may think you are or you're not. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter your financial status or your social status. If you're part of the ecclesia, the assembling together of the body, you are just as important as the one sitting next to you or the one standing in front of you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If this is the case, and it is, we should begin to change our minds and our focus 
on why we gather together. We've got to shift the way that we think about doing church. I'm going to make a bold statement. Hang on, buckle it up. Hallelujah. If what we were doing as the church had actually been working, our communities and our nations would already be saved. We have been engaged in religious rituals and activities that maybe we got a few saved. I believe the Bible's our example. I'm looking for the day that in Queensland, maybe the Sunshine Coast even, that we see 3,000 people born again in a day. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say it cannot be. It, maybe not in your world, but in Jesus' world it can be. Amen. Amen. Maybe not where you've seen it, but God's going to show you things you haven't seen yet. Hey, you need to get ready. God's moving and God's shifting and God's changing. And he's bringing the church into a place to where we're not just surviving, but we're reviving everything that we touch. We're bringing life. The Bible says that the words of, of God, they are spirit and they are life. Ah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians, or excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together. That word gathering is the same word as assembling together. We are gathering together to Him. There's purpose in gathering. I do believe that the days are getting short. I do believe that Jesus is coming back and it could be any moment. I do believe that we as the church need to make sure that things are ready because religion tells, up, tells us that Jesus just could come and slip up on you at any minute. But the scripture actually says, brothers and sisters, that he's coming after a church that's without spot, and without wrinkle. We got a lot of spots and wrinkles in us. Hey, get the iron out. Hallelujah. God's coming back after a church. He's sending Jesus after a church that's without spot or wrinkle. One that has been assembled and ready and doing what God created her to do. Praise God. I want to give you two scriptures real quick again. I want you to see them and write them down if you didn't. John 14, 12 again. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes. Any believers in here? Four. We're going to give an altar call. Are there any believers in the house? Hallelujah. Woo. If somebody saved your life out of a burning building, would you be thankful? Well, you just got saved out of a burning hell. You got saved out of an eternity without God. That's something to be excited about. That's something to be enthused about. Amen? My prayer is there's a fresh baptism of zeal being poured over all of our lives today that we cannot keep quiet about this wonderful work that Jesus has done in our life. Woo! Hallelujah! Ah, glory to God. Pardon me. Mm. He who believes in me, the works that I do... He will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now, now holy is not a religious term. It's a governmental term. People look at the word holy and they get all the woo, holy, woo. No, 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 that's not it. The word holy is attached to royalty. And it means to be set apart for a purpose. Holiness is not what you're separated from. See, religion says holiness is, is what you're separated from and you're holy if you're separated from, from all of the evil in the world, if you pull yourself back 
and you stay away from that evil, then you're holy. That's not the definition of holy. Holy does not mean separated from. It means separated unto. So we're not separated from the evil of the world. We're separated unto Jesus. And Jesus makes us holy, and he puts us in a dark, wicked world, and he says, change it. Woo! We don't run away from evil. We invade evil. We don't run away from darkness. We invade darkness. We don't run away from challenges and struggles. We step into those things in the name and the power of Jesus, and we see those things change. His kingdom come, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You are a people today that has the entirety of heaven backing you. One of the words we used a while ago was the word repent. Everybody say repent. Repent in religion says, I got to lay before the Lord on my face. I got to cry and blow snot in the carpet. I got to, you know, I got to get up. My nose has got to be red from where I've just rubbed it on the carpet in repentance. And I throw ashes over myself. And then I've repented. No, that's confession with a lot of drama. Right? Let me give you the, de the definition of the word repent. The word repent, it literally means this, change the way you think. When we tell God we've repented or we say we've repented of something, we've literally said we have made a decision to think differently about some things. When you repent of your sin, you think differently about that sin and your involvement in that sin. The mindset, your mindset, whether you realize it or not, your mindset is directing your entire life. Amen. Amen. You are what you think. I was growing up in the South where we eat a lot of fried stuff. We were told we are what we eat. But that is false doctrine. Hallelujah. You are what you think you are. Right? That's what the Word of God says. So what do you think about yourself? What do you think about you? Where's your part? You are a part of the body. You do have a gift of God. As a matter of fact, you are a gift of God. Amen. And when you begin to fit into that place, there is a surge and release of power and glory and favor upon your life like never before. We need to stop trying to be somebody that we're not and be who God created us to be. Amen. You know the reason there's a lot of fighting and murmuring and gossiping and all that stuff in church? It's because we're trying to be something we're not. Are you with me? We need to understand that God has called each of us to a very peculiar task and that task has an operation to bring strength and glory to the body of Christ. Are you with me? Woo! Glory to God, things get stirred up, don't they? I love it. So be who God called you to be. My heart cannot say, today I want to be a lung. You'll die. Amen. Your finger, your hand, can I say, today, I want to be a toe, and you go walking around on your hands. That's out of order, right? Some of you might walk on your hands good. That's good. Praise God, but you don't put shoes on your hands, right? Where do you fit? What is your role? What is your purpose? When we get this, there is going to be a supernatural explosion within this region like never before. Mm. Freddie, come on up. Come on up. Listen to this. When you find your place, it allows the church to be greater than it's ever been. So many people today are hurt and wounded because they, they tried to operate in a place where they had no grace. Listen to this. When you find your place, there's going to be so much grace for you to do that. It's going to be First nature to you. Not second nature. First nature to you. Father, my prayer today, come on, just lift your hands. My prayer today over this body of believers is that each of us begin to find our place. Father, these are chosen people. 
These are all royalty in this building today. Holy Spirit, empower us. Holy Spirit, forgive us for being out of joint with you and one another. Father, I pray today that the light would come on. Revelation would begin to take place of where we fit in this body. Oh, we bless you. We bless you. We bless you, Lord. 